What's up lazy dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a great day. Today, as I promised you several videos ago, we're going to talk about these okri trials we got going on over here. I've got my Eat More Okri shirt on. I'll put a link in the description below. You can grab one of those if you want one. But we've got six different okri varieties over here. We're doing kind of a trial to see which ones we like and kind of compare and contrast those varieties. Earlier this year, we grew, I think it was four different varieties over on that side of the barn and kind of compared those and had some we really liked and had some we probably won't grow again. Now it's pretty windy out here today, but we're gonna do the best we can. I'm gonna take you around and show you all six of these varieties. We'll look at how the pods look different. The growth habit of the plants is different amongst these six varieties. So we'll kind of compare all those things. And before we go out there, I have let these grow. I haven't picked these in probably about a week. It's been raining a good bit and I don't like to pick it when it's wet because it just doesn't store very well. And I've been trying to do this video for a few days but the rain has stopped me. And I thought, well, I'll just let them kind of grow out and get really big, let all the pods get really big. That way we can really see the differences between them. So a lot of these plants do have some pods on them that are too tough to eat. But at least you can see how big the pods do eventually get. And we can also see at what length the pods become tough or at what length the pods stay tender for each of these varieties. So let's start off on row number one here where it's mostly this Alabama red okra. But we've got actually only one plant that's producing anything of this Okinawa pink okra. And this Okinawa pink okra looks a lot like red burgundy to me. And it does pretty good at staying tender even at the long lengths. You can see all those pods on there. But even some of these bigger ones here, that one's probably a little too tough. And that one is. But some of these here, I'd say, you know, six or seven inches or so, are staying pretty tender. So that's always a good sign. Too bad I only have one really good plant of those. I didn't have a whole lot of seeds and some of my seeds got washed away after I planted. I don't know what happened with that guy right there might have got the top taken out of it yet reason it's not producing but for the one plant i have i do really like this variety i like the pod size i like how they stay tender and um, that's definitely a good one we might keep later on now let's talk about this alabama red oak tree right here now these are really really pretty they look nice and uh, it's definitely something unique to grow. These plants get tall really quick. So, you know, if the plant's getting too tall, it's gonna inhibit harvesting for you, which it will for us. You're gonna get a shorter production window on these than you would some of these other varieties. This is definitely the tallest variety I've got. We've got some of these plants over there that are a good seven foot tall or so. And these pods here do get tough a lot quicker. And that's usually the case with all these kind of short fat okra varieties so you really want to pick them all when they're about that size right there these ones on here that have gotten bigger mm, that leaf is slapping me. these ones on here that have gotten bigger are probably too tough to eat so you got to be really diligent about picking these at just the right size because when they're tiny like some of those right there that ain't a whole lot to eat right there but that one right there is probably just right. So these are tricky at getting them at the right size, but it's a pretty good variety. Uh, like I said, really, you know, pretty to look at. I can see where they would do really good on a farm stand table, but the height of them and the lack of tenderness as they get bigger makes me not super crazy about this variety, although it is really, really pretty. Now on this middle row here, these are probably the two shortest varieties of the six we have planted here. So at the beginning of this row, we have the Chopi or Choppy Okri. Not really sure how that's pronounced. And on the other half, that's farthest away from us there, we have Cajun Jewel Okri. Now this Choppy Okri here, I'm just gonna call it Choppy, even though it may be Chopi, is Probably one of my favorites out of these six here. It looks a lot like that Louisiana green velvet oak tree we grew earlier in the spring. It's got some nice smooth pods on it. And these stay pretty tender at longer lengths. That one there's still tender. That one there's been on there too long. It's pretty tough. 
but most of these can get on up to eight or nine inches or so and still be tender and i like the growth habit of these they stay short but they stay upright they don't try to branch out too too much and um i just like this variety the more i grow different varieties of okri i seem to like these smoother ones like this that say tender at longer lengths like this one and the uh, louisiana green velvet so this one right here is definitely one of the ones at the top of my list now this cajun jewel okri here stays short plants don't get too tall you can see contrast that with the alabama okri there which in my opinion is a good thing that they stay short get a longer production window out of them before they get too tall these the pods look different than that choppy okri these have kind of ridge pods oh and there's got ants all over it and these pods don't stay as tender at longer lengths that one there is obviously pretty tough that one there is pretty tough so you have to get these when they're a little smaller i'd say closer to five or six inches or so the production on these is really good it's more productive than the uh, Alabama okra there. But one thing I don't like about these is these want to branch out really, really bad. And we try to prune our okra, as you can see on all those others. We try to prune it as it grows cause just because it's easier to pick it when all the pods are at the top there. And this is a booger to prune because it just keeps wanting to produce all these side branches. Now, if you're the type of person that likes a big bushy okra plant, you're just gonna plant a few and let them bush out all they want to this is probably a great variety for you but it doesn't really fit the way we like to grow okra because it wants to branch so much so you know given the branching and given the fact that the pods get tough quicker than some of these other ones this cajun jewel is just all right in my book and then on this last row here we've got this heirloom fat okra that someone sent us that's what they called it fat okra and then down on that end the shorter plants are the burmese variety now this fat okra here took forever to start producing in fact it just started producing and i don't have any way of telling but i believe this is the same thing as star of david okra it looks just like it um, the pods the shape of the pods look like that alabama okra over there but these are all green. They don't have the kind of red tinges on them. So if I had to guess, I'd say this is the same thing as Star David. These short, fat okra varieties like this do get tough pretty quick, just like the Alabama okra that I mentioned. So you gotta pick these just right. You know, there ain't a whole lot to eat right there. That's probably ideal size. That right there is probably a little too big. Just like the Alabama okra, the plants on these get pretty tall pretty quick they're not as productive as some of these other varieties the okra is good to eat when you get it the right size but the whole height issue it becomes a tree pretty quick and um, this one was just really really late to start producing I don't really know why so it's not a terrible variety but not a home run hitter for me and this Burmese okra right here is probably right at the top of my list as far as this trial goes with that choppy okra over there. Now this stuff will get huge. Now some of these are going to be tough because they're just massive, but some of those are 14 inches long, a little longer. These do have some ridges on them. It's a lighter color pod. It's not a dark green pod. But that one, I mean, it's tough, but it's not super tough. But some of these are... 12 inches long or so still feel tender enough you could chop them up and eat them so these are really productive these stay short like the choppy okra over there does and um, pods are tender productive it's easy to prune i really 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 like this burmese variety now as far as the taste comparison between all six of these varieties they all taste pretty good to me they've all passed the okra raw taste test and there's not one of them that really stands out above the others and there's not really one of them that just flat out stinks they're all pretty good to eat as long as they're picked you know before they get too tough now these shorter fatter okra varieties here are pretty good for frying just because they have those ridges and they have more surface area on them and they'll kind of soak up the breading a little bit better so these are really good frying okras the alabama red 
and this fat okri that I think is Star David here. Now these smoother okris right here are really good for pickling because you can stack them in the jar tighter. If okri's got them ridges on it, that's going to not allow you to pack them in a jar as tight. So I really like these smoother ones, like the choppy, like the Louisiana Velvet for pickling because you can really pack them in the jar tight and get more per jar if you're doing some pickled okra or putting up okra like that. And then these kind of ridge varieties like the Burmese and the Cajun Jewel here, just good all around okra varieties. Like I said, you can't really tell a big difference in the taste and that's kind of why we lean towards more looking at the growth habit, looking at the productivity, looking at how long the pods stay tender. Now this okra trial here with these six different varieties and the trial we did with the Ford varieties earlier this year is completely subjective because I have a certain set of characteristics or traits that I like to see in an okra variety, but those traits that I like could be completely different than the traits you like in, you know, a particular okra variety or that you like to see from an okra variety. So for me, I like plants that don't get too tall too quick. I obviously want something that's productive and I want something that's going to stay tender a little longer. So if I don't get to pick it every other day or so, I'll be just fine. And when you harvest those long pods of okra, you're getting a lot more okra per harvesting effort. It takes just as long to harvest this as it does this, one cut with a knife or however you're picking it. So you're getting a lot more per effort with this than you are this little guy here. So based on my humble subjective opinion, we have from the first trials we did, the Ruiz okra which is that heirloom a viewer sent us. And uh, speaking with him, I think he's gonna try to have some of that to sell. And when he does, I'll let everybody know where you can go buy. It's a really, really good variety. So we like that one from the first trial. I really like the Louisiana Velvet from the first trial. The Jingo Orange was pretty good. Um, it didn't just necessarily blow me away, but it was a good red variety, one of the better red varieties of okra I've tried. The Perkins Long Pod, I wasn't super impressed with that just because it wasn't that productive compared to those other varieties. And then out here, I mentioned the Chopi and the Burmese, excuse me, the Burmese and the Chopi or Choppy are probably my two favorites out of these six here. I really need more plants of the Okinawan to, to make a fair assessment there, but for the one plant I got, I really like it. Uh, I'm going to have to grow out some more of those to really give that a fair assessment. But the Burmese and the Chopi would be the winners. I'm just not a huge fan of these short, fat okra varieties. So they would be last, and then the Cajun Jewel would be somewhere there in the middle. And we have not even come close to trialing or comparing all the different varieties of okra out there. There's still a bunch of them out there that I've never grown. I do have some seeds in my office. A viewer sent us, I think, five or six different varieties. Uh, and one of them's called Gold Coast. I can't even remember all of them. Anyway, five or six varieties. I wasn't able to squeeze in this warm season, but we'll plant them next year and then we'll do some more comparisons and look at those and see how they do. Should be fun. I love doing these okra trials. We get some great food off of it. And we can also really compare these varieties and see the differences between them and then share that with you so you can pick which variety you like. And if you have tried any of these varieties that we grew either on our first trial or this trial and you have a different opinion than we do about those varieties or maybe the same opinion, let me know what you think about those in the comments below if you want to add to my evaluation of those varieties. So we'll let all six of those varieties there, we'll let them just go until we have a frost. We'll keep harvesting them. Some of those may get too tall and fall over or whatever, but as long as they're upright and still producing, we'll let them keep going. And then once we get a frost that kills them, we'll go in and cut them with loppers at the base, but we should still get plenty of good harvest off those guys. Now that we covered the okra part, I want to talk to you about some of the cool season cover crops that we're going to be trying out around here. Got some new stuff in the mail recently. I want to go over that because it's getting soon or it soon will be getting time to start putting some cool season cover crops in the ground where we're not going to be planting vegetable crops. And I want to show you some of this new stuff I got. Now, as far as cool season cover crops go, there are lots and lots of options out there. More options than there are for warm season cover crops, in my opinion. And with cool season cover crops, it's a lot easier to 
mix different varieties or different species than it is in the warm season. In the warm season when it's hot, that hot weather you know tends to push things to go to seed a lot faster and you have to really kind of match up maturity dates so you get the best out of each cover crop that you have in your warm season mix. But in the cool season we get these things growing in the fall, get them established fairly well before it gets real cold or the cold kind of slows the growth some and we don't have to worry about them bolting or go to seed as much so we can have a little more freedom with mixing and playing around with different things. Now last year I had really good luck with the frosty bursine clover. I really really liked it. We're going to try a different clover this year. I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. I really really liked the frosty bursine clover. It was really really tolerant to mowing. Would be very tolerant to grazing if you've got some livestock. That was a big winner for me last year. The Kodiak brown mustard, which we use for biofumigation, uh, for nematode control. We'll be talking a lot about that more in some upcoming videos. I really like the Kodiak brown mustard that I mixed with some daikon radish. That was a really good combination. We ended up planting our Irish potatoes behind that combination, and they did really, really well. So I liked those two um, cool season cover crops that I grew last year, and we're going to try some different stuff this year. So let me show you what I got. I got one order from Green Cover Seed and then I got another order from True Leaf Market. We'll start off with the stuff I got from Green Cover Seed. So I had a viewer or subscriber recommend these and I've always wanted to kind of try them. So this is a variety of kale called Bayou Kale. It's a hybrid kale that can be used as a cover crop. And this stuff here is supposed to be really good to eat, not just for animals, but for humans too. But it also makes a really good cover crop, makes some nice dense foliage and get some good weed suppression. So since we've got our chickens over there, I figured this would be a good one to grow and let them graze on this stuff here. And we can go out there and harvest some of it too if we want to. I've never grown kale just completely as a cover crop, but this variety is specifically designed for that purpose. So we got this bayou kale here, we're gonna give that a try. That should provide some nice forage for the chickens. It's not gonna fix nitrogen like some of your other cool season cover crops, but we should get at least get some dense ground cover from it and have some food to eat for us and the chickens. And I mentioned the frosty bursine clover that we grew last year that we really, really liked. This year I'm trying this balanza clover. So this is called fixation balanza clover and just like the bursine clover this is pretty tolerant to grazing but the advantage of this over the bursine is this fixes more nitrogen so you can get more bang for your buck as far as the nitrogen that that cover crop or this clover cover crop is adding back to the soil so we're going to give this balanza fixation clover a try i really like this from green cover seed because it's already inoculated we don't have to inoculate it. it's already coated with everything so when we get ready, all we gotta do is just kind of throw this out there, rake it in, give it a little water, boom, we're ready to go. And then the last thing I got from Green Cover Seed is this radish here. So we planted daikon slash tillage radish many times um, as a cool season cover crop. This is a variety I haven't tried before. This is called nematode control radish. You'll also see it out there under the name defender radish. So this is gonna make those nice deep roots. They're gonna give you lots of soil aeration, reduce compaction, all kind of good stuff, nutrient scavenging. But this particular variety is supposed to make more vegetation than the standard daikon radish varieties. And in that vegetation, once you chop it all into the soil, you'll get some nice nematode control from it as well. Kind of like we do with the mustard that we grow. So I just thought we'd try something a little different. I always plant some kind of daikon or tillage radish. Figured we'd try this nematode control version of it and see how it compared to what we've grown in the past. And then as far as the stuff I got from True Leaf Market, I've got this garden cover crop mix. So this is a pre-mixed um, package here or pre-mixed assortment of seeds. And I have made my own mixes in the past. I have mixed Austrian winter peas, hairy vetch, tillage radish that did really well and like I said you can have all kind of fun mixing different cool season cover crops because you don't have to worry about them bolting or going to seed as much as you do in the warm season. Now this particular mix has all kind of stuff in it and I had to write it down so I can remember. 
So here we've got clover, Austrian winter pea, hairy vetch, mustard, radish, forage collards. I think there might have been some wheat, some triticale in there, and some more things that I didn't have enough room for to write down on my piece of paper. So this is a solid, solid mix with all kind of different stuff in it. I'm really looking forward to growing this and just seeing all those different species out there. The more diversity you can add with some of these cover crops, the better they are going to be for your soil. So we're going to give this garden mix a try. And then the last one is called Mighty Mustard Mix or Mustard Trifecta Power Blend. I had several names for the same thing on their website. So we grew the Kodiak mustard last year. And if you've watched any of my older videos on growing mustard for nematode control, the spicier the mustard is, the better it works at controlling nematodes. Now you can grow just the Florida broadleaf mustard, the standard cheap mustard out there. You can grow that and that will help with nematode control and you can eat some of that. But the spicier the mustard, the better it works for controlling nematodes. And we like to plant cover crops of mustard where we had our okri or where we had crops that are susceptible to nematode damage. It really works well to follow those with this mustard to reduce those harmful parasitic nematodes. So the Kodiak brown mustard we grew last year is a pretty spicy mustard, not anything you'd want to eat, but really good, you know, really effective at the nematode suppression. This one here, this mix has three different types of mustard in it. It's got the Kodiak mustard. It's also got one called Pacific Gold Mustard and got one called White Gold Mustard. And each of these different mustard varieties produces its own set of these chemical compounds called glucosinolates. And that's what actually does the nematode suppression. So because we're mixing three different kinds of mustard with all these different kinds of glucosinolates, we get a lot broader nematode suppression than we would if we just planted one variety of mustard, or at least that's the thought process here. Now, not only can these mustards reduce nematodes, they can also suppress weeds, they can suppress fungi, they can suppress harmful insects or pests that may, you know, bother your garden. They have a lot of good benefits. Supposedly the white gold mustard that's in here is better at weed suppression, whereas the Pacific gold and the Kodiak mustard are better at nematodes, fungi, insects, that kind of stuff. So this should be a really good comprehensive plan for some natural biological pest suppression in our soils. We'll just have to see how it grows out compared to that Kodiak we did last year, but it has the Kodiak in there, so I expect it to do really well. Now, as far as planting all these guys, I've got a little bit of a window, basically any time in October. Ideally, I'd like to get my cool season cover crops planted in early October. Even though most of these are pretty frost tolerant, some of them down to five degrees or even below zero, I think I read on one of them was tolerant down to minus five, which we'll never get that here. So even though they're frost tolerant, once it gets really cold or once you start getting some freezes, it's gonna slow them down a good bit. So you wanna get them established and going before it gets really, really cold. So I like to plant mine in early October if I can, but I've, you know, the whole month of October, I've got plenty of leeway there. Get them in the ground, get them established before we start getting a first frost, you know, end of November, early December. And we're in zone 8B, as you might know, in here in South Georgia. So if you're north of us, you probably want to start thinking about getting some of these in the ground now. You've got a month or so window, like I said, but uh, you want to give them time to establish before it gets cold, even though they can take a frost. So if you've tried any of these new to us cover crops that we've got this year, let me know about that in the comments below. And if there are any cool season cover crop questions about mixing certain things or varieties that you want to see me try in the future, definitely put those in the comments as well. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe, ring the bell, like, and share. And we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Oh, well mm -hmm. by the beauty of your life